Good morning, everybody. My name is Sheila. I'm an animal care specialist here at Brookfield Zoo. And today we are bringing special orangutans to you. I'm going to be talking to you from the Tropic World Asia section where we're just about to maybe have a rainstorm. Um, we're going to talk though, have you ever come to the zoo and seen the SSP logo or species survival plan? Do you know what that means? You might know that it means a cooperative breeding program. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what that means from my perspective. I am an SSP coordinator for two animals, two species of animals. One is called the Joffrey's Marmoset and one is called the Calamico. We have those both in the South America section, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience. But I'm actually going to show you the orangutans today. So if we can pan over, they're up there in their nest at the moment. Um, I'm going to talk to you about several different Ephesus peas, one being the orangutan one. I'd like to first start off just by introducing you to the animals that you are looking at. So on your left is Kekasi. Kekasi is 11 years old. She was born here at Brookfield Zoo to her parents, Ben and Sophia. At um, now, excuse me, she's 12 years old. At 12 years old, she um, is not with her mom and dad right now. Instead, she lives with Kachil. Kachil is a seven year old animal. He was not born here. And I'm going to tell you the story of why he came here in just a little bit. But let's get back to talking about SSPs for just a little bit. Because I'm going to tell you a little bit first about what it's like to be an SSP coordinator. So I'm the SSP coordinator for, let's talk about Joffrey's marmosets for first. I can tell you that there are 94 marmosets living in 26 zoos across the United States. And as SSP coordinators, one of my jobs is to make sure every one of those animals are, health, are happy and healthy. Am I still okay talking over this rain? Can you hear me okay? Hopefully. Hope my microphone's good. Um, welcome to the rainforest where you never know where you're going to get a rainstorm. So with the marmosets, I said there's 94 of them. They're in 26 zoos throughout the United States. I could tell you every single one of those names, their birth dates, who their parents are and a lot more information about every single one of them. I keep the records all in what is called a stud book. And I can, you know, coordinate information between all these different zoos if there's any questions about them. Um, for Calamico, there's actually, I could tell you about 500 of them living in 140 zoos all across the whole world. For Calamico, that's kept as an international stud book. So I try to keep all these animals healthy, happy, and they live in their family groups. So if something were to happen at one zoo, where if they have an animal pass or something, one animal ended up alone, that would not be a happy animal. And that zoo could contact me and say, hey, we need a friend for this animal. And because I have all these records, I would know um, what other zoos might have extra animals that you know, may want to form their own group. And so I can help zoos work together that way. Also, if zoos ever have questions about maybe the health of an animal, um, because I serve as a point person, I have um, a lot of stories to tell about different animals. And I could maybe say, they might call me and say, hey, has any animal ever had this? And I might know, yes or no. Or I could say, yeah, that happened at such and such zoo. And then I could put the two zoos in contact with each other. So that's a really great example of how zoos work together as a very cooperative program. Now I'm not in this all by myself. Um, I do have a team of people who work for me and like both species have their own veterinary advisor and a nutrition advisor. And this could be anybody from any zoo around the country. For marmosets, I have a vet and a nutrition advisor that both come from the Philadelphia Zoo because they just happen to have a lot of experience with marmosets there and they have such a good resource for me. And for Calamico, we have a lot of experience with them right here at Brookfield Zoo, so a veterinary and nutrition advisor is right here and can help me answer any questions like that. And also, um, I do work with people around the world, especially in Europe, so for Calamico, I have a point person over there from the Dublin Zoo in Ireland. And for Calamico, or sorry, for the marmosets, my point person over there is from a zoo in Spain. So that's just kind of an example of how SSPs work and how we try to coordinate the, their interactions and the SSP point person or coordinator can help facilitate that. 
So while you're all watching Kekasi and Kachil up there, I'm going to go back to want to tell you about Kachil's story and how the orangutan SSP helped him keep, keep him happy for his whole entire life. So T Kachil was born at the Toledo Zoo. Unfortunately, as does happen now sometimes, um, his mother was unable to take care of him at that time. The Toledo Zoo keepers worked really hard with them and coordinating with the SSP about what's the best situation for, for him. They worked so hard to try to work him back with his mother at the time and that just wasn't working out. The keepers provided around the clock care and they ra raised Kachil while at the same time trying to work and getting him back with orangutans because you don't want an animal, an orangutan growing up thinking he's a human. So at Toledo Zoo, they had a few orangutans they tried him with, and it just wasn't working out to give him any social companionship with his own species. Now, the orangutan SSP knows a whole lot about the approximately 230 orangutans living in 52 zoos all around the country, and they will actually have a list of other female orangutans around the country that are known to adopt other babies and serve as a foster mom. So if you have a situation like this where their own mom can't take care of them, you can go through the SSP and they will help facilitate finding a match for a foster mom for him. So when he was about five months old, he went to the Milwaukee Zoo where there was a female there known to raise other babies. And he was at Milwaukee Zoo for close to a month. Those keepers worked really, really, really hard trying to have him bond with their female orangutan there. But Unfortunately, it just didn't work out. So when he was six months old, he came here to Brookfield Zoo, where on the SSP list, there was a female named Maggie who was known to adopt um, other infants. So um, he came here one day, which I remember quite vividly, approximately noon, he arrived here, and we had put him in with Maggie by one o'clock, and those two were instantly inseparable. They took to each other immediately. It was such a great sight to watch. Um, Kachil was so happy for that mother figure and really bonded with her. But at the same time, Maggie just really enjoyed having the baby. And I have a baby picture here if Lynette wants to flash back. And here they are when they were, I guess he's probably about a year old in that picture and that's Maggie. So one of these stories that kind of brings tears to my eyes as I'm remembering these early days when Kachil was brought here and bonded with Maggie. So now when Maggie, when Kachil came here, Maggie was 53 years old at the time. The average life expectancy of a female orangutan is actually only about 30 years. So at 53 years old, we knew this was probably not going to be a long-term thing. And we actually, Maggie was not the first choice to put Kachil with because, but at the time she was his best option. And so he came here and they had, I mean, just a wonderful time. She did a great job raising him for a period of time. But at the same time, because, you know, keepers are always planning ahead, we wanted to get Kachil to know other orangutans. So when Kachil was very young and still living with Maggie, Kekasi, who you see there on his left, we began doing introductions with Kekasi and Kachil and Maggie too, and they were playdates, we called them. So Kekasi was six years old at the time, and she was living with her mom and dad, but we would be able to separate her from mom and dad for brief periods of time and have her go over with Kekasi and Kachil. You know, she'd come and ring the doorbell and say, can I play? And they would come in. And those two had a really good time together, and they got to know each other. Um, very well with Maggie still there and supervising. So the situation worked out really good for two years and then unfortunately at the age of just about 55, Maggie did pass away. Um, we were grateful for the time they had together. Maggie just really enjoyed having that baby and we were happy to have, you know, she had happy final years for sure. And she did a really great job of getting Kachil through those really critical infancy dependent periods. So now at three years old, he was a little more, little more independent. Um, you know, at that age, they're still around their moms a lot. But Kekasi and him had got to be friends. So Kekasi kind of came over and lived with him. Uh, Maggie did pass away one afternoon, and it wasn't until the next day that we were able to put Kekasi in. 
Um, don't worry, Kachil did not spend a single night alone because Keeper spent the night here with him, making sure he was okay. And then the very next morning, we were able to put Kekasi in with him. So I guess I could say at this point, they all lived happily ever after because you're looking at the situation now. These two have been together for several years. Um, they have just a great relationship. They're, I would say, more like brother and sister. Um, Kate, Cassie, and Cachil at first would sleep together in the same nest. And it was really interesting to watch because as they grew and developed, um, they would start normally getting more independent. And they started sleeping in the same nest, but just kind of more like on opposite edges of the same nest. And then you would see two nests built but like right next to each other and connected Aww. and they would sleep like that. And they kind of got a little further and further apart and now they do each build their own nests as would be normal for someone their age. And yeah, they really do get along super well. Right now you see them up there in a pile of wood shavings with some um, pumpkin seeds mixed in there. That's one of their favorite little treats. And you see they, um, Sometimes they share nicely. They're doing a really good job there because the seeds are small enough. Kekasi is the older sister and she does, you know, make sure at times that Kachil knows she is boss. But they most, for the most part, they get along really well. Do we have any questions at this point about Kekasi, Kachil, orangutans or SSPs? Uh, how about a question about SSPs? Okay. So, um, I think most people think SSP is just for breeding purposes, um, that you want to bring in an animal that would be compatible. But it sounds like it's a whole lot more than that. Yeah. Um, are there any instances where at Brookfield Zoo we um, maybe collect animals, not collect, that's the wrong <laughs> word, <laughs> house animals here um, so that other institutions can focus on their breeding? Yeah, absolutely. Every animal has, you know, uh, a, should I say a purpose? But, you know, some animals, like Maggie at 53 years old, she would no longer be a breeding animal, but she is great as a foster animal. Um, some zoos choose to breed. Some zoos just want to have a big exhibit to um, educate the public on and just have hold a group of animals that don't breed. As SSP coordinators, I always ask the zoo, what are your interests and what do you want to do like that? There's different, you know, research that goes on at different zoos. So, you know, certain animals might be good with that. I have a project going on with marmosets about what happens when two females are living in a group, if you have a mom with younger daughters. And so there's a hormonal study going on that where they're collecting fecal samples from these animals to test their hormones and see how it affects mothers and daughters like that. And each species is very different. Marmosets and Calamico live in family groups. Orangutans are a little more solitary species, so sometimes called semi-solitary. So um, some of our animals, we have a single a male that lives alone because that's kind of his preference. So males, especially adult males, may tend to live alone. So, so in addition to personalities and <laughs> things like that, what other things do you have to consider before um, moving an animal to a different facility? Sure, lots of considerations. A big one is health. Um, and I guess this all follows under personalities, but some animals react to change well and some don't. And we don't always know why that is, but it's something that you know we would consider. Sometimes you have two animals that are together that are really, really well bonded. And um, sometimes you can move, split them up and give them a new friend and they'll be fine. But other times zoos tell me like, oh, you know, these two are so bonded, you know, we're worried about what would happen if we split them up. So I just say, well, okay, why don't you keep those two together and I'll, you know, move other animals around. Okay. Um, we have a question that uh, kind of talks about um, animal welfare and things like that. Uh, they mentioned that Brookfield Zoo seems to have a lot fewer animals than it used to back in, mm -hmm. you know, a couple decades ago. Um, why would that be? Um, it, you know, all varies. Um, the, things go up and down with everything. Um, depending on your animal needs, sometimes when you have geriatric animals, they don't want to be in a small group or you can't move them around as easily. So, and then that's a huge big um, purpose or uh, help to the SSP to hold animals that need to be held in smaller groups for some reason. 
So um, that's it. And sometimes it actually really helps to focus more on a fewer number of species, a fewer number of animals, instead of having a whole lot that you know, you're not as focused on. You can achieve um, sometimes greater education purposes, greater research purposes with fewer animals. So it's a huge benefit to SSPs to really manage what's best for the animals too and trying to strike that balance about meeting the needs of zoo guests and versus the needs of animals. Yeah, and I think I'm correct in saying that through a lot of the work that the SSPs have done, we've learned more about what animal needs are. So instead of, you know, putting eight polar bears right. in the same area, we've learned that they prefer to be solitary. Right. Right. And guests often like to see bigger exhibits too. So if you have bigger exhibits, that means you might have fewer exhibits too. So as um, the zoo is growing and expanding, you're getting uh, you know, fewer, bigger exhibits. Mm -hmm. uh, how long do orangutans live? Um, so females live longer than males. The average life expectancy of a female is 30, a male is 20 years old, but Whoa. just like humans, they can range quite a bit. So um, Maggie was 54 yeah. at the time she passed. So they can live up into the 50s, but that is more unusual for them. Mm -hmm. We have Ben here that is 42 years old to a male orangutan. So um, a lot of times when you have these geriatric animals that you know we're talking about live in smaller groups, it's a reflection of the better care that they've been receiving in zoos over time that they're living a lot longer now too. So you did mention that they've got uh, pumpkin seeds right now, right? Yes. What other types of enrichment do you offer them? Oh, we have a whole list. The way our diets work is our nutritionist tells us that kekasi can have 75 calories per day for enrichment and kachil is also at 75. It's based on their size. And she said 75 calories and we probably have a list of 30 different items that we can give them and then the amounts vary. So in a forage pile like that, we could do pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, Cheerios, Rice Krispies, Raisin Bran, might be some examples. A lot of times our enrichment involves like what we call a spreadable treat. So we could do something like peanut butter or applesauce, jelly, honey, um, even baby food they seem to really like a lot. We do a lot of juices, um, apple juice, pineapple juice, orange juice. Um, actually, one of their favorites is prune juice. Wow. Uh, peanut butter. And then we do um, some sugar-free stuff like Jello and Kool-Aid. And there's probably a whole bunch more. But we do have quite a variety of things. And our nutritionist really, she obviously believes in nutrition and wants them to have healthy stuff, but she also wants them to be happy and have the variety and have the things they enjoy so she just gives us a big list and says whatever each animal wants is fine as long as it's within this calorie amount yeah moderation yep right all moderation all of course the orangutans love browse i know there's been some other chats on leafy stuff that we call browse and we do have some banana leaves and um, some bamboo around the exhibit today too but they're choosing to like those pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are one of their favorites. Yeah. <laughs> and I put a variety of stuff out here, but they're like, oh, they just want the pumpkin seeds. <laughs> and that actually, my next question was going to be, what are their favorite foods? Yeah. But there we go, pumpkin yeah. seeds. And you know, other diets, they do like the fruits. They eat a lot of leafies. Um, they're more fruit eating than the other apes. So gorillas are mostly leaf eaters. Orangutans are a little more uh, fruit eaters. And we do watch the sugar content in the fruit, so we give them a limited amount of what we call high sugar fruits, such as like bananas and grapes are high sugar fruits, and then lower sugar fruits, they get um, more of those like strawberries and blackberries, grapefruit, watermelon, um, cantaloupe, you name it, we get it. We even try to give them some native fruit. Um, the story that I'm thinking about fruit is we received some jackfruit. Um, you may not have heard of that. You can look it up, but I didn't hear of it either. And we got it. We weren't even sure how to feed it out. I'm like, well, just give it to the orangutans. They'll know what parts to eat because <laughs> they had these things that look like seeds and some lighter yellow parts and darker yellow parts. And we weren't not sure what's good. And yeah, we just gave it to them. They knew what to eat. But it's interesting because that was a fruit that comes from Asia. And we gave it to all the animals here in Tropic World, and I found it really interesting that all the Asia animals ate it, and the South American and African animals did not like it. <laughs> I'm just going to pan over real quick to this great 
enrichment arrangement that you put out so carefully <laughs> that they have completely ignored up till now because <laughs> that looks like so much fun with the ice and the branches and all those big leaves so but. can you see the giant popsicle <laughs> i put up there so this uh, sums up my job in a nutshell you can plan out the stuff all you want and they're going to do whatever they want and um they give you throw surprises at you all, all the time <laughs> So they chose not to lick my popsicle today and they want my, my pumpkin seeds and you know, it's all about happy animals. So if that's what they want, that's what they want. Uh, speaking of high sugar content, is it possible for orangutans to get diabetes and other health issues? Yeah, it is absolutely possible and something that our vets would test for at routine exams. All of our animals have you know routine exams on a specific schedule, kind of dependent on the animal needs. So it's something that vets would screen for. And um, we've had diabetic animals in the past. We have great training programs here. We have trained animals to accept insulin injections as needed. And there's different oral medications that can be, um, that they can do to treat diabetes. And that's something that, question I've gotten about marmosets. So I've had a zoo call me and say, hey, do you know my animal's uh, diabetic? And there was a paper published about diabetes in a similar species that I happened to know of, so I was able to give that to the zoo. And then when a second zoo called me about it, I would say, hey, why don't you talk to this zoo because you two can work it together. And all my, I have a couple diabetic animals in the marmoset population, and they're all doing really well just on diet modifications, and some of them are on oral medications and doing really well with that. Um. One question that we get a lot on our videos about Maggie mm -hmm. is, um, I know she's no longer with us, but we still get a lot of comments on the old videos <laughs> about how um, she she didn't look um, as maybe fit <laughs> as, <laughs> as some other orangutans. So um, there's so much like us primates are well because we're primates, but other primates here are so much like humans. Do they? have the same kind of fluctuations that humans have and absolutely they do um, all of our animals are weighed on a routine basis again depending on animals some of them are right weighed once a week orangutans are usually once a month and they're all trained to get onto a scale and our nutritionist comes by at least like once every three months and does body condition assessments and then we base their diet on what they look like and a lot of times animals need to lose weight and we'll put them on a weight loss diet. We've even had a few competitions around here that we like to call the biggest loser competitions <laughs> and two of our orangutans, Ben and Brunei, were both overweight so you know it helps to keep the keepers motivated too to provide always healthy snacks for them and yeah so Maggie specifically she was um, a little more round than other orangutans and she was actually diagnosed with a thyroid condition and we were able to put her on thyroid medications and that really helped her lose the weight. And we used to have a before and after photo when she was still here, but it's a very holistic approach to management. And we'll also try a lot, you know, along with diet, um, just like in humans, you know, exercise is a very important part of that process. So we will try to plan our enrichment sometimes around getting more activity for the animals. So while they're super enjoying their pumpkin seeds up there, you can see it's not providing a lot of activity. So if I had an animal that I really wanted to lose weight, I would maybe do this enrichment sometimes, but we do other things, such as my beautiful popsicle over there that's um, <laughs> melting away. Um, but I can hang that up in a vine so the animals have to climb up and stretch and, and like support themselves to get to it. And that would be something that's more, we do, um, we have different uh, enrichment items that might make them climb more and give them more activity. Mm -hmm. So basically, if people see animals that maybe don't look like what their ideal animal should look mm -hmm. like, keepers are well aware of it and it's being managed and there are potential reasons oh, that yeah. we might not see Absolutely. for why that animal maybe yeah. doesn't look that, and, like the perfect Yeah, and you would even be animal. surprised because different species have different body shapes. So like spider monkeys are very long and lanky animals. That's normal for them. But, gorillas who eat a lot of leaves they have a big stomach to help them digest the leaves so that's actually very normal for them to have mm -hmm. a more round appearance so you have to know your species well too again that's where someone the ssp 
there's generally an SSP for every species. So there's an orangutan SSP, a marmoset SSP, a spider monkey SSP, a gorilla SSP. So they really focus on the needs of the individual species there. Oh, and we've got, I'm, I'm just gonna do one more question on this and then we'll move on. Um, but somebody wants to know what they've gotten di diabetes or any of these other diseases uh, if they were in the wild. Yeah, I would suppose so. Um, you know, we're not there to test for it, and most likely um, they may not survive a lot of time if that was in the wild. Mm -hmm. But here in, cap in uh, managed care, we do provide them with uh, veterinary care, and so we're able to, to control all this. And that's, you know, one of the reasons animals live a lot longer lives right. in zoos. Exactly. All right, how old are they, and how big are they? Okay, Keiko C is 12 years old and she weighs about 80 pounds. She is the one on your left. Is that correct? Am I saying mm -hmm. my left or right? Yeah, you're, you're correct. It's a, <laughs> I'm not yeah, sure how the TV show No, it's not mirrored. <laughs> okay, so Keiko C, she's facing us there, and Kachil is seven years old. He turned seven in January. Oh, I feel like he just got here yesterday. I know, he's so big. I look back at these pictures. Um, can I share one more story that I'm thinking of when he was yeah. a little baby? I could tell two things about how Maggie just took such great care of him. Um, when Kachil was really young, you know, she, Maggie didn't carry him as much as a mom would, but she did really care for him a lot. He would start to climb around, and he could climb up, but he couldn't climb down. Oh, right. So sometimes he would climb up a vine and then be stuck there, and he would start, climb, start crying. And um, as a keeper, we couldn't do that because we couldn't go in with them with Maggie there. But Maggie would come over and go get him. Like she'd go sit right by him and he would climb onto her and she would get him down that way. And another little funny story I'm thinking about, I remember the day I was watching them and Kachil, when he was a baby, he always liked to sit in a little, um, on patches of hay. Or we keep the whole cage, um, whole enclosure completely bedded. And he was just used to that. Well, one day he went over to another enclosure and there was not bedding on the ground. And so he was sitting in the back on this little bedding and he was kind of trapped there like his own little island. And he started crying. And Maggie at the time though, had a delicious snack of honey. Oh. And she was really enjoying her honey while Kachil was in the back crying. It <laughs> and it's good. like, okay, Maggie, you gotta help him out, you know? And Maggie got some honey. And I just remember she um, put her stick down. She walked over, she got Kachil, picked him up and came back, came back and dropped him on a full, um, full bale of hay and then she went back to her honey <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's like she knew exactly what he wanted you know how to make your baby stop crying so that you can go enjoy your meal in peace yeah i remember that and he would it was like he was playing floors lava because then he would figure yeah. out if he put hay in each hand and yes. each foot and he would kind of locomote across the floor just like yes. with this oh my gosh that was he so still funny. does oh that a lot goodness. to this day he really? likes to kind of have something in his hands and he likes <laughs> you know something under his feet so um, Interesting little animal. So uh, Kachil is darker than Kekasi. Will he get any lighter? Orangutan color varies and Kachil actually matches Maggie a lot. It was really interesting to see how he blended with her and we kind of wondered if there was some sort of camouflage going on there like if he became darker when he was with her. Um, but the orangutans just have that little bit of variation like that so I think that's just normal variation. I love that Kekasi is starting to look like a real orangutan and not a baby <laughs> orangutan. I know. You can see it in her face. Yeah, she's growing up. She's 12 now and it, like, I don't know, she's still a baby to me. So I've been here since she was born. And I forget, like I just actually prepared for this. I'm like, what? She's 12 already? It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, do Kachil and Kekasi interact at all with Heidi and Sophia or uh, any of the boys off exhibit? Uh, no. <laughs> Our orangutans right now are housed in three separate enclosure, three separate groups. Um, orangutans, I said, they're they're semi-solitary, but there's some flexibility. Like if they were in the wild, they kind of live by themselves, but then they would travel through the forest, and then they may come in contact with other orangutans and be around them for a little bit, and then go on. And whether they're interacting with them or just around. So we, you might see our groupings change for, from time to time here. Kids especially seem to like to play. So Heidi has actually had play dates with Kekasi and Kachil and something that we're trying to do again. They seem to really 
enjoy the play dates. Um, Sophie's not so fond of her daughter leaving her. So again, it's about keeping everybody happy. So, but it's really important to give them, you know, proper socialization. Mm -hmm. um, another little tidbit about something that SSPs knows with marmosets and calamico, it's really important for them to get what we call infant experience. So when a new baby is born in the group, the older siblings help care for them and they'll carry the babies around and of course pay for them, they'll share food with them. And so for marmosets, that's really important, something we keep track of is do they have infant experience. And with orangutans, you know, we're monitoring that. They're more solitary, so maybe not as important for the species, but you know, having social experience with other animals is really important. Mm -hmm. um, we've been getting a lot of questions about when the buildings will reopen. <laughs> and all I can say to that is just keep checking the website because we're reopening things as it becomes safer with uh, COVID restrictions being lifted. Um, so at this time, we don't really have any solid plans for a lot of our buildings. Um, so just, just keep checking back. Yeah. All right. I think we're all kind of going through this. Can I show one more thing? Yeah. Should we flip over to the gibbons? And actually, sure. if we walk down, Let's my walk otter down. is swimming. So just a side note about SSPs. They said there's an SSP for each species. And we have our two gibbons sitting up there in the trees. And, um, and this is Inda and Nubo. They are mother and son. Inda's 32 years old and Nubo is six, almost about to turn seven. Um, we have a mother and son here right now. We had a breeding pair. Unfortunately, we have lost the male more recently. Um, but just again, to tell you how SSPs work, gibbons are very, um, they're social animals only to a point. They live just male and female, they're monogamous, but with their offspring, we'll stay with them only until they're mature, and then they do not want to be around here anymore. So Inda and Benny had four offspring. Malupre was born in, I believe, 1998. When he was nine years old, he would want to have his own female and start his own group, so the SSP helped us pair him up. He went to San Antonio Zoo where he was paired with a nice 13-year-old female named Maya. And they have had four kids now, three girls and a boy named Gibson, Jude, Harrison, and Henley. And so that's kind of how that works. Uh, Tani and Gong are two recent boys, Nubo's older brothers. They, um, because they were so close in age, they actually moved out together. Sometimes brothers will bond like that and go off, and they lived in a zoo called uh, Winston Wildlife Safari, which is in Oregon, and they had a beautiful island habitat there for a few years, and now just real recently, they actually both got their own females, so Ooh. they're paired up. And now if we go down, Lynette, wow. I'm so excited well, to I show you <laughs> my new animal. You guys are getting your first look at Pearl. We had a pair of otters here, um, Elliot and our female at the time was named Daisy. Now otters normally live till around uh, 12 years of age on average. Daisy was 20 years old, so it speaks for the longevity that can be achieved under proper conditions. And uh, da uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Daisy passed away um, within the last year and Elliot was alone. The SSP wants all the animals to be happy and didn't want Elliot to be alone. So they knew at Columbus Zoo, they had a group with a lot of offspring and Pearl was um, two years old at the time and she came to us to be our new breeding female for Elliot. She disappeared. And up oh, here she's coming back, okay. but she's up against the wall. <laughs> But yeah. Pearl is, she just actually turned three years old now, and she is full of energy. Um, she keeps Elliot young, and um, this is your first look at her because she came here during the pandemic, and the has not been, uh, uh, Tropical has not been open to the public yet. Is she down there, or are you just looking at the water? I'm just looking to see <laughs> if she'll seeing, appear. <laughs> I'm seeing waves down there. I'm seeing but, waves, and I'm like, she's got to come back this way eventually. Oh, right? she's there way in the corner. <sighs> She's, oh, she's, uh, you know, we could walk down Let's there. Let's walk she's down actually, there. She's going to be hanging out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, today is live minnow day. Oh, and so okay. she actually so just caught a minnow over. while we were looking at the water. <laughs> of course. You <laughs> get stuck. Okay, where are you at? See, she's down there. Okay. Oh, she's got that minnow. Yum. So and this is Pearl. She is now a three-year-old otter. And I said she is just full of energy. 
and she <laughs> she keeps Elliot young, but at the same time, Elliot sometimes um, doesn't have as much energy, and he is take a little nap at the moment. But she's super happy foraging there. And we have a slide in the back of the exhibit um, that Pearl does use sometimes, but I find it actually really fascinating that, that um, the slide has been here forever and Elliot really wasn't showing that much interest in it, but once Pearl came, I've actually seen Elliot go down it several times. Oh, really? So, where's your, where's your minnows? Can you find them? You have to go hunt. She's looking at us. She's like, what's going on? <laughs> she is saying hi to her adoring fans that are meeting her for the first time. And she says, I can't wait to see you. So hopefully we'll be opening up at some point. Like Lynette said, you know, your guess is as good as ours. We just have to wait for the guidelines to change. So thank you very all very much for joining us today. Hope you learned a little bit about SSPs and enjoyed seeing Kekasi, Kachil, and our gibbons and otters. Have a great day. Well done. <laughs>